we are making a Sid tie top. And this pattern is extremely versatile. It's my favorite thing about it. You can do a dress, you can do a top, you can add sleeves, you can do no sleeves. There's a lot of different ways that you can kind of mix and match to get what you want. Um, today, we're going to be doing the top version with sleeves. So if you're making a dress, if you want to do a sleeveless version, those elements can be found in the dress video, which I will link in the description. And I had to break them up into two different videos, otherwise this one would be super long and confusing. So we're just gonna do the top today with sleeves. I'll also be walking you through how I cut the pattern pieces. It's pretty straightforward, but there's a few different markings and notches that I wanna make sure you don't miss because they're really important to the pattern, which if you haven't printed the pattern yet, make sure that you're printing it with the layers function. That's like highly, highly recommended for this pattern, especially so that you can clearly see all your notches and markings on the pattern for your specific size. And layered printing is all outlined in the instructions as well. All right, before we jump in, I just wanna give a pep talk to all the beginners, people who um, haven't sewn very much, or maybe this is like the first thing you're ever making. If that's the case, you've got this. It's gonna be great. Your top is gonna to turn out cute. And also I feel like there's some exciting like elements of this pattern that are gonna make you feel like a sewing wizard. So I'm excited, let's do it. When you go to cut your fabric, every size and fabric width will have a different optimal cutting layout. So don't stress too much about finding that. My personal belief is to just wing it, try your best, kind of play Tetris and see how things fit on the fabric. I'm going to start with my front bodice. I need to cut two of these pattern pieces mirrored. And so what I did is I cut it on the fold, but then I'm gonna cut just a sliver of the fold out of the way so that they're two separate pieces that mirror each other. There are a few important pattern markings on this piece, one of which is the grain line. You always wanna make sure that long line with the arrows is running parallel to the selvage edge of your fabric. And then there are a handful of notches on this pattern piece as well. Mainly there are four notches in the center front, which I've marked, one in the arm side. And then I also do a couple little notches with my rotary cutter at the end of the dart marking. For the pie shape of the dart marking, my favorite way to mark this is with a Hera marker, which you can see me using here. It's just a little plastic tool and you can run it on top of the pattern and it will transfer a crease onto your fabric that doesn't require any chalk or ink or anything, but you can clearly see it on the fabric. Although that creased line from the Hera marker is easy to see from my eyeballs, this tutorial is for you guys. And so I'm gonna go in with a little purple crayon and just redraw those lines so that you can see them more clearly. Now I'm going to go in and cut my back bodice, which is one piece on the fold. And one thing I want to point out here, there are two cut lines on both bodice pieces. The longer cut line is for a top, which is what we're doing today. And then the short cut line is for a dress. So if you're making the dress, make sure you fold that back because you won't need the full length bodice. As for notches on this pattern piece, there are three. So one is on the side seam, that is to mark where the dart will line up from the front bodice. Then there's a notch on the arm side, which is actually a double notch, two lines right next to each other. You want to mark both of them. And then you also need to mark a notch on the fold at the back neckline. I've been left with this nice open space of fabric, which turns out to be the perfect size for my binding. So first what I'm going to do is find a 45 degree angle which will mean we are cutting on the bias. Both your binding pieces and your ties need to be cut on the bias at this 45 degree angle. A couple things to note about this bias piece. First off, there is also a different cut line for the dress bodice or top bodice, depending on which one you're doing. So since we're making the top, it's going to be the full length binding. And also the two binding pieces need to be mirrored. Otherwise the notches will end up on the wrong side. So what I'm going to do is cut two separate pieces and then I'm going to lay them down on top of each other, right sides together and mark the notches that way so that the notches end up mirrored. The most unique marking on this whole pattern comes on the binding and it's this little triangle shape that kind of looks like two pieces of pizza next to each other. That you want to mark with either chalk or a hair marker like I'm doing here and it is not to be cut. So transfer those markings onto both of your binding. Again, make sure they're mirrored. And once again, I have marked them in purple crayon so that you guys can see them clearly. Cutting the 45 degree angle for the binding left me with this really nice triangle piece, and I know I'm gonna be able to get some ties out of it. 
I'm using a combination of the actual paper pattern piece and just the dimensions of the tie as a reference to figure out the best, most optimal way to cut these ties. As you can see, I got three ties from this chunk of fabric, and then I went back into the 45 degree angle in the main piece of my fabric to cut five more ties. They're a little sort of ski wampus, but they're just like the best way to cut without wasting fabric. All right, on to the sleeve. So I need two sleeve pieces mirrored, and there are three notches on the sleeve head that I don't want to miss. There is one at the front, one at the back, which is a double notch again, and then one at the center. And those will align with the front arm side, the back arm side, and the shoulder seam. One thing I do want to call out here, you'll probably see there are decent sized chunks of fabric that aren't really getting used for this pattern. And that's just kind of the way the cookie crumbles sometimes with different patterns and how they line up with fabric and fabric widths. For example, this is a quilting cotton, so it's only 44 inches wide, which doesn't allow for a lot of wiggle room on the pattern layout. But don't worry, I will not be throwing any of this fabric away. I save all of it, I use all of it. I have tons of scrap fabric that gets a lot of use. So no worries if you don't use every single thread. All right, let's do a recap of what we've cut. We have two sleeves mirrored, a back bodice cut on the fold, two front bodice pieces mirrored, two bindings mirrored, and eight ties. Amazing, we finally get to start sewing and we are gonna start by stay stitching all the curved edges on the bodice pieces. And a stay stitch is a quarter inch seam allowance at two millimeters stitch length. And these will just help all of these curved edges not get stretched out while we are sewing our garment. For all of these stay stitches, we want to start at the shoulder and go downward along the curve. So here we're starting at the shoulder going downward along the arm side and finishing at the underarm. And then for the neckline, same thing, starting at the shoulder, down along the curve of the neckline. Doesn't matter which side you're stitching on, you just want to start from the top and go downward. A quick note for the back bodice neckline, you wanna have two separate stitches starting at the shoulder and ending at that center back. You can see there that they don't connect. All right, time to sew our darts. So we are going to fold our front bodice piece over to line up these dart markings. And this is why I like to put a little notch at the end of my dart so that I can very easily see where this lines up. So I always start by lining up these end points and then I find where the dart markings come to a point and mark that. And then I put one pin in the middle, easy peasy. Sew along this dart marking starting at the side seam and heading toward the point. And you do want to backstitch at the side seam, but do not backstitch when you get to the point of the dart. There you want to cut a very long tail thread and tie those threads off in a double knot. This will prevent like bulking and weird spots in your dart. Repeat these steps to create another dart on your other front bodice piece, and then you're going to fold the dart downward on both. Now lay out your back bodice and put your two front bodice pieces on top right sides together, line them up on the shoulders and pin them in place. We are simply going to straight stitch these shoulder seams together at a 3 8 of an inch seam allowance. That will leave us with raw edges and we always want to make sure that we're finishing any raw edges. So I'm going to be finishing mine today with my serger, which I'm obsessed with and love, but it's definitely not necessary. You don't need a serger for this pattern. You could just zigzag stitch instead. Look how cute. Okay, now we are going to finish the side seams in the same way that we did the shoulder seams. So here we're lining up the dart marking to the notch on the side seam of the back bodice. Then go ahead and stitch up your side seams with a 3 8 of an inch seam allowance and finish them with your serger or zigzag stitch. Press both your side seams and your shoulder seams back toward the back bodice. Cute. Okay, now that it's starting to take shape, we are going to set it aside and start working on the ties. The ties are folded individually like bias tape. So if you've never done those before, it's basically just one fold in half, and then you take the long raw edges and fold those toward the center. And then you fold the whole thing in half 
again so that those long raw edges are kind of tucked on the inside. And the way that I like to fold these ties is by doing two at a time because there's a lot of like steam and heat and whatnot. It just makes it easier to be able to do one fold and then move to the next tie while that first one is cooling down and then alternate kind of back and forth. And I find that it goes pretty quick. Even though we're doing eight ties today, honestly, it's kind of soothing to do all of this ironing. And honestly, it does go pretty fast. One thing I'll note, I don't finish the ends of my ties just because they're so narrow that they really don't fray hardly at all. And I've sewn hundreds, thousands of ties at this point, And truly, I feel like it's not worth the effort to seal up those ends when they barely make a difference at all. But personal preference. We're going to edge stitch along these ties to seal them closed and each machine is different. My machine seems to handle the ties pretty well, um, but one thing that I do do is chain stitch them together so that I don't have to stop and start my stitches over and over again. I can just kind of keep the thread going. So when you get to the end of the tie here, you're going to kind of slide the next tie in place. And I do have to push my presser foot up just a little bit to slide the next one under. And I also find it quite helpful to start my needle maybe half a centimeter into the tie, backstitch a little bit, and then continue forward. Every machine is different, like I said, but that is just what works well for mine. So you can see here, I'm left with a long chain of ties and I'm just going to individually snip them apart. This will leave me with eight separate ties and then I'm going to go ahead and pin them in place on the bodice. You can either baste them onto the bodice now or pin them in place. I prefer to just pin them. In fact, I'm actually clipping them. I'm obsessed with these clips. They make binding and ties so much easier. I'll actually link them in the description. But anyways, you're going to line up those ties with the notches that you cut in the front of your bodice. So there will be four on each side. Now we're going to jump into my favorite part of the whole construction, which is the binding slash mitered corner. So take your two binding pieces and find the short ends that have the notch cut into them and pin them in place right sides together. You want to double check that these bindings are mirrored so the notches should be lining up together. Stitch that in place at a quarter inch seam allowance, not three eighths, quarter inch. You're going to press that seam flat and then lay your binding out wide. Find the side that has no notches on it. So here you can see the top side for me has notches. So we are going to press the bottom edge up a quarter inch. I'm pretty good at eyeballing a quarter inch, but it's always good to double check your measurements because especially for a small binding like this, a little bit of error will make a big difference. All right, now find those three marked lines that you drew on your binding piece, two of which are diagonal, one is horizontal, and I want you to fold along the horizontal line and we are going to stitch along the diagonal line. Make sure you're doing some good back stitching here and this is what the end result should look like. Repeat those steps on the other mitered corner marking on your binding, and then you are going to be left with a shape that's kind of like a squared off U, comes to two right angles, and you're going to press those triangle shaped seam allowances down toward what will be the back neckline. So now you have your two mitered corners, you have notches in the center back and the shoulders, and then you have notches that will also align with the center front and the ties. Okay, this is where the super fun part comes in. So I want you to line up your binding along the center front and the neckline. Don't worry too much about the neckline right now, just make sure it's not twisted, but I do want you to start pinning at the mitered corner. From there, line up all the notches on the binding with the notches on the center front and their corresponding ties. Because the binding is cut on a bias at a 45 degree angle, it does have a little bit of stretch to it. And that's a good thing, we want it to have stretch. Sometimes, depending on the fabric, it could have more or less, but sometimes that causes this binding to stretch out a little bit. So if your binding stretches farther than the hem of your top, don't worry about it. It's not a huge deal. I'll let you decide if you want to extend it a little bit and cut off the extra or if you want to try to squish it into the space, but it's not a big deal. It's totally normal. Mine ended up having a tiny bit of extra length, but I just kind of squished it in place and it all worked out. 
Now to pin the neckline in place, what I want you to do first is line up the center back seam with the center back notch and the shoulder seam with the shoulder notches. Those will give you good anchor points. In between those anchor points, you may need to stretch your binding just a bit. It's intentionally supposed to be that way. If it wasn't stretched a tad, you would end up with some gaping. And if it wasn't cut on the bias, you would end up with a lot of gaping and just kind of an odd shape. So you definitely want to have this cut on the bias and don't be scared by a little bit of stretching. Continue stretching and pinning all the way around the neckline until your entire binding is pinned in place to your bodice. Attach the binding to your bodice with a straight stitch at a 3 8 inch seam allowance. And I usually backstitch over my ties just a little bit to help keep them in place. You don't want them going anywhere when you're tugging on them. When you get up to the mitered corner, pivot your needle right when you get to the diagonal stitch line. When you're going around this curved neckline, there is going to be some stretching like we talked about with the pinning. And you'll notice a little bit of bunching near where you're sewing, but as long as what's directly under your presser foot is flat, clear of gathers, clear of bunches, you'll be fine. Don't worry too much about having everything else sit flat until it's directly under your needle. Once you've attached the entire binding to your bodice, you're going to take a pair of scissors and do some little snips into the seam allowance near the mitered corner. And that will just help reduce some of the bulk so that when you turn it inside out, like we're going to do now, you can poke into it with something kind of blunt to give it a nice point and there won't be that extra bulk. Now fold that binding over directly on the seam and press it in place. I would really recommend taking your time on this step, especially making sure that this binding is folded directly on the seam, taking your time around the neckline, making sure everything is pressed as flat as you can get it. Finishes like this take a garment from being like, oh cool, you made that, to being like, holy crap, you freaking made that? Once the binding is pressed and looking beautiful, you're going to edge stitch the entire thing in place, pivoting at the mitered corner once again. You'll need to stretch the binding just a tad as you sew around the curved neckline, but you probably did most of the work when you pressed it, so it should be a breeze. At this stage, I like to tie my ties, mostly because they're cute and I'm excited, but also because it gets them out of the way as you're adding the sleeves. But before we can get to the sleeves, we need to hem your top. First, we're going to press our hem up 3 8 of an inch, and I'm going to double check my measurement because I don't 100% trust myself to get it right first try. And then we're going to fold the hem over again, this time pressing it up an inch. And once you've pressed that hem all the way along your top, this is a great time to try it on because if you want to make any little adjustments, make it a little longer, a little shorter, this would be the time to do it. And once you are happy with your hem length, then you will edge stitch along the entire hem to finish that up. We are so close to being done. All we need to do now is add the sleeves. So grab a sleeve and you'll see along the sleeve head, there will be double notches on one side, a single notch in the middle for the shoulder seam, and then a single notch on the other end for the front bodice arm side. So we are going to do two rows of basting stitches in between the far notches. And a basting stitch should be at five millimeter stitch length. The first row of basting stitches will be at an eighth of an inch seam allowance. And the second row is going to be at a quarter inch seam allowance. So these two stitches should be running parallel to each other and they should not cross. Repeat those basting stitches on your other sleeve head, and then we are going to fold the sleeves in half and stitch along this side seam at a 3 8 of an inch seam allowance, also finishing the seam with either a serger or a zigzag stitch. Go ahead and press that seam. I like to press it back toward the double notches, and then turn it right side out because we are going to hem this sleeve. <laughs> 
You'll notice that the hem of the sleeve is curved just a bit. It's not a straight across line and this gives the sleeve a really nice shape when it's finished. That can make hemming the sleeve slightly difficult, but because it's on a curve and on an angle like we learned with the binding, there's a bit of stretch to it and it's gonna be fine, trust me. I'll walk you through all my tips. First, we're going to turn the hem up a quarter inch and press it. And if you're able to do a scant quarter inch, I would definitely recommend it. It for sure will help you in the next step. Next, we're going to fold the hem up half an inch and press it in place. So basically the elastic we're using is three eighths of an inch wide. So it gives us a little bit of wiggle room, but you really don't want to be pressing this up much further than half an inch because that can get pretty tricky. If you're having any trouble at all folding this hem up, I want you to pay attention to this spot. So you'll see that the fabric wants to kind of fold and stop at that curve, right? Because if you're not stretching it, it's just going to try to lay as flat as possible. So I want you to take your other hand and as you're ironing, as you're going, really use that angle of the fabric to stretch it into the shape that you want it to be and then press it in place. One other place that can be a bit finicky is coming back to where you started from. So you see here, there's a little bit of a weird like warping point where you started. But again, if you kind of just stretch it out a little bit and then iron it in place, you'll be just fine. All right, now we are going to edge stitch that hem in place, but make sure to leave a little bit of a gap. And I try to leave my gap on the flattest part of the hem. This is where we're going to insert the elastic. Once that's been hemmed aside from the gap that you left, you're going to take your elastic and a small safety pin Attach the safety pin to the end of your elastic, and then you're going to insert the safety pin with the elastic attached into that little gap and use your fingers to kind of push and pull the safety pin throughout the entire channel, dragging your elastic with it. And once you get to a point where your elastic is almost going to get entirely sucked up into the channel, I would pin it on the outside just to make sure it doesn't get sucked up in there because then you have to start over and that's annoying. When your safety pin comes out to the other side, remove the safety pin and you're left with two tails of your elastic that we are going to attach together. Because these elastic tails are so small and so narrow, it's really difficult to get any sort of pin in them. So I usually just hold them in place and then drop my presser foot down on top. Now the intention here is to zigzag stitch these in place. For a bigger elastic, it would be easy peasy to zigzag stitch this elastic. But because the elastic is so small, my machine in particular, the feed dogs just don't really grab it. So what I'm going to do is I kind of do a few zigzag stitches, use my presser foot, use my hand wheel, and kind of adjust it around so that I've done enough stitches to keep it secure and keep it in place. But full transparency, it's not pretty, but it does the trick. Once that elastic is secure, you can insert the entire thing into your little channel of a hem and then close up the gap. Give that stretchy sleeve hem a little bit of a tug and you have a nice evenly placed elastic at the end of your sleeve. Next, we are going to insert the sleeve into your bodice. But before we do that, we want to start gathering the sleeve a little bit. So find those basting stitches that we did a few steps previously and holding on to the two threads that are on the wrong side of the fabric, you are going to pull your fabric so that it bunches up into gathers. And you don't need to do a crazy amount of gathering. We just kind of want to get the process started. So start on one end, gather up toward the center seam, and then go ahead to the other side of your sleeve and do the same thing. Find those two threads that are poking out of the wrong side of the fabric and pull them until it's gathered up to the center notch. Okay, now we're ready to insert the sleeve. So Pull the sleeve through the armhole so that the right sides are together, but we're looking at kind of an inside out view. We're going to start by pinning a few key spots here. So find the side seam of your bodice and pin that to the seam of your sleeve. 
and then find the shoulder seam of your bodice and pin that to the center notch on your sleeve. As a note, anytime that I'm pinning anything that is gathered, I'm going to put the pins on the side of the gathers. So in this instance, the bodice is not gathered, but the sleeve is. So the pins, I am inserting them into the sleeve side or they will be facing up on the sleeve side because that's the side that's going to be facing up when I am sewing and attaching the sleeve. All right, the last couple key points that we want to line up here are the double notches on the sleeve with the double notches on the back bodice and then the single notch on the sleeve with the single notch on the front bodice. If you get to this point and see that your notches are backwards, like the double is aligning with the single notch, then that just means your sleeve is in the wrong hole. So put it in the other side. Once all those key spots are pinned in place, you're going to grab the basting threads that we had started to pull, started to gather on, and you're going to continue gathering until those gathers are even across the armhole of the bodice. Get all those gathers pinned in place and your armhole should look something like this. Now we're going to stitch around this armhole with a 3 8 of an inch seam allowance and you'll see here, like I talked about, I am stitching it with the gathers facing up because I find that you can even them out better if you can see them because if they're on the underside it's obviously a lot trickier to make sure that they're even. I did want to call out one thing about the method we used for the basting stitches. So our two rows of basting stitches are going to be completely within the seam allowance, right? Because our final stitch is at a 3 8 of an inch seam allowance and the basting stitches are at an eighth of an inch and a quarter of an inch. Another common method is to have your final stitch be in between the basting stitches. And the purpose of that is to like help your stitches be more even. But personally, I feel like this method gets you just as even of stitches and then you don't have to go back and unpick any basting stitches that will be visible on the outside of your garment, which I personally despise doing. So I'm a big fan of this method, but of course you can do whatever method you prefer. Finally, you need to finish this raw edge, which I will do with my serger. You can zigzag stitch if you want. And then the very, very, very last thing we're going to do is we are going to press the gathers of our sleeve so that they're not quite so poofy. So the seam allowance should be pressed toward the bodice. I am so proud of you guys for finishing your tops. I want to see pictures, tag me in your pictures. And if you decide you want to make a dress version, which I highly recommend, that video is linked in the description.